Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. We here at Fresh Vision Church want to thank you for taking the time to watch and hear this special Easter message. Now, even though millions of lives have been affected by this current pa coronavirus pandemic, um, Christians around the world will still be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This week, I came across these words that accurately depict what Resurrection Sunday means to believers, even in times like this. It's called Hope Is, and the author is unknown. Hope is faith in the immutable promise that miracles prevail when the darkness tries to win out and moves with the pledge of a better tomorrow. And what's more, hope springs forth resurrection life and draws us near to the love of Christ, who is the light of God, who walked out of the grave to make the way of everlasting life. Easter Sunday celebrates the rebirth of life eternal that illuminates the light of hope, which perpetually shines upon the soul. For as he did then, God eternally still calls forth despair from the darkness into his spirit's resurrection light. For truly, what is this day if not one that dawns hope eternal in the glory of Jesus' resurrection light? This morning, we're going to look at the meaning of the resurrection and why it's significant to our Christian faith. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2 and follow along as I read verses 22 and 24. While you're turning there, please uh, join me as I pray for this morning's message. Lord Heavenly Father, we are thankful for what you did on this day over 2,000 years ago, that your Son, Jesus Christ, rose from the grave. And because of that, we now have hope. We now have life. We have uh, a living faith, Lord. I pray that as this more message is delivered, that you use me as your messenger, Lord, to speak truth. I pray that those who are listening will receive this message with soft ears and a soft heart, Lord, so that your word, that this message may be implanted deep within them, Lord, so that it may spring forth fruit Yes, this time is difficult. This time for many is challenging, Lord. But I pray that you strengthen them, that you encourage them through this message as well, Lord. That you show them that even in the darkness, there is light, there is hope, and there is beauty, Lord. Pray for our first responders, our nurses, our doctors who are out there treating those that are sick. Lord, and we pray for revival in this land. We pray for healing. We pray that you will do a mighty work amongst your people, Lord, so that they may shine more brightly in our communities, in our homes, in our cities, state, in our country, so that more will come to know you, Lord. Bless, bless this message. We look forward to hearing from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. As I mentioned, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be just reading a couple verses there. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. And there, the Word of God says, Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. Verse 24. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. The key phrase here that I want us to focus on is where it says in verse 24 that it was not possible for him to be held by death. 
three days had passed since the horrific events that occurred at Calvary. There, on a wooden cross, hung the lifeless body of a man who took upon himself the sins of the world. A short time later, he was wrapped in a linen cloth and placed in a tomb cut out of rock with only its entrance shut by a rolling stone. For two days, no sound of life could be heard in that tomb, nor was there a ray of light that entered it. Then early in the hours of the third day, something extraordinary occurred. On that Sunday, over 2,000 years ago, God's Spirit appeared in that tomb and breathed life, life into that body that had been laying there. Inside that man's chest, a heart began to beat, muscles began to twitch, and then a pair of eyes opened. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, was no longer dead. He was alive. His body transformed from the perishable to the unperishable. One sown in weakness, now raised in power. From temporal to eternal. At that very moment, death was defeated. And Jesus was raised up in victory. In Romans 14.9, Paul writes this. Christ died and returned to life for this that he might be Lord over the dead and the living. As I mentioned earlier, every year on this day, Christian churches around the world will be sharing messages about what happened on, on that Sunday morning in Jerusalem and why it's significant to believers. My intent is essentially to do the same. However, the majority of this message will be directed towards those who maybe aren't believers, and maybe those who have doubts about the validity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So throughout this message, I'm going to try to answer some commonly asked questions regarding the resurrection. But let me first begin by saying that the reason I and many others believe that Jesus rose from the dead is because I trust what the Bible says. I believe in the accounts of the eyewitnesses and I accept by faith he was raised from the dead, is still alive, and is currently sitting at the right hand of God, eagerly anticipating his glorious return. No, I wasn't there to see it with my own eyes, but neither were those who say it didn't happen. Yet, the difference between those who believe and those who don't is one main factor, faith. Here's how Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 describes faith. Now faith is a reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. Thus, as Augustine puts it, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. There are some who are probably watching or listening to this message who have doubts about the resurrection of Jesus. Or maybe you do believe that Christ rose from the dead, but aren't sure why it's such a big deal. Well, I hope that some of those questions will be answered this morning. And that those answers will ease your doubts and or reinforce the importance of the resurrection. So let me start off by answering some very basic questions. First of all, what is the resurrection? The 1828 Dictionary defines it as this, a rising again, chiefly the revival of the dead of the human race or their return from the grave. Today's Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines it as a state of one risen from the dead. Now here's how I would define it. Again, this is my own definition. A fully functional human body coming back to life after being pronounced medically dead. Now the reason I, it's important to define this is because there is a lot of misconceptions about the resurrection. A lot of people believe the ideas of Hollywood saying that the resurrection or anybody rising from the dead are basically zombies. 
Again, it's a fully functional human being that's been risen from the dead. Now, who was resurrected? The Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit to a virgin woman, a man who was fully human and fully divine, the promised Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world who is still alive and is sitting at the right hand of God. Now what makes his resurrection unique from all other resurrections, either before, during, or after, is that everyone else who came back to life ended up dying again. He was the first person ever to die and to rise from the dead and to still be alive at this very moment. Now let me go on into some deeper questions. Why was he resurrected? Well, to answer that question, I have to refer back to the Bible. The first answer is found in a passage I read earlier from Romans chapter 14, verse 9, that he might be the Lord over both the dead and the living. In the, in the Greek, the word Lord here means to rule over. Thus, Jesus is now the ruler over death and life. The second answer is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In the Old Testament, when the priest waved the sheaf of the first fruits before the Lord, it was a sign that the entire harvest belonged to him. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it was God's assurance to us that we shall also be raised one day as part of a future harvest. And a third answer is found in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He has shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of of the Holy Spirit. It was proof, undeniable proof, that he was indeed who he said he was, the Son of God. John MacArthur said this, without the resurrection, Jesus' death becomes the heroic death of a noble martyr, the pathetic death of a madman, the execution of a fraud. But he wasn't. He was God's only begotten Son who came to take away the sins of the world. Now, what is the evidence of the resurrection? Well, there's a lot. And I wish I had the time to explain or try to give them all to you, but let me just share a few here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes that besides him and the other apostles, he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Now, some have said that just because the disciples think they saw Jesus, it doesn't automatically mean that they really did. Well, let's look at this a little bit further by briefly examining three possible alternatives. Either they were lying, they were hallucinating, or they really saw the risen Christ so let me ask you, which of these is most likely? Well, were they lying? On this view, the disciples knew that Jesus had not really risen, but had made up this story about the resurrection. But then why did 10 of the disciples willingly die as martyrs for their belief in the resurrection? People will often die for a lie that they believe is the truth. But if Jesus did not rise, the disciples knew it. Thus, they wouldn't have just been dying for a lie that they mistakenly believed was true. They would have been dying for a lie that they knew was a lie. Ten people would not all give their lives for something they knew to be a lie. Furthermore, after witnessing events such as Watergate, can we reasonably believe that the disciples could have covered up such a lie? Here's what Chuck Colson famously said. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. They even proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. 
Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if they weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles will keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Now, the other theory is that they were hallucinating. Well, this theory is untenable because it cannot explain the physical nature of the appearances. The disciples record eating and drinking with Jesus as well as touching him. This cannot be done with hallucinations. Second, it's highly unlikely that they all would have had the same hallucination. You see, hallucinations are highly individual and not group projections. Therefore, since disciples could not have been lying or hallucinating, we only have one possible explanation left. The disciples believed that they had seen the risen Jesus because they had really seen the risen Jesus. So, the resurrection appearances alone demonstrate the resurrection. C.H. Spurgeon said, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is one of the best attested facts on record. There were so many witnesses to behold it, that if we do in the least degree receive the credibility of men's testimonies, we cannot and we dare not doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection is a fact better attested than any event recorded in history, whether ancient or modern. So let me now ask this question. Why is the resurrection important? Well, let me give you three reasons. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus is the heartbeat of the Christian faith. Its existence rests on the fact that he rose from the dead. Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Regarding this passage, John MacArthur wrote, The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single greatest event in the history of the world. It is so foundational to Christianity that no one who denies it can be a true Christian. A person who believes in a Christ who was not raised believes in a powerless Christ, a dead Christ. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then no redemption was ac accomplished at the cross and your faith is worthless. Paul goes on to say, and you are still in your sins. If Christ was not raised, his death was in vain. Your faith in him would be pointless and your sins would still be counted against you with no hope of spiritual life. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus guarantees believers that he has indeed forgiven us of our sins and the relationship between us and God has been restored. Paul affirms this in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. He was handed over not only because of our sins, but in order to put them away. He was raised to life to make us right with God. That is, in order to demonstrate God's complete satisfaction with the work of Christ by which we are justified. In the first instance, our sins were the problem that needed to be dealt with. In the second instance, to make us right with God is the result that is assured by Christ's resurrection. There could have been no justification if Christ had remained in the tomb. But the fact that he rose tells us that the work is finished. The price has been paid and God is infinitely satisfied with the sin atoning work of the Savior. Number three, the resurrection of Jesus assures us that we have an intercessor at the right hand of God looking out for our best interests. 
Going back to Romans again, here's what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He is also at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. So not only did Jesus die for our sins to redeem us, but he was raised from the dead to justify us and is now an advocate for us. As our advocate, our defense attorney, Jesus lives to make intercession for us continually. This means that he's up there right now telling God not to punish you for your sins because you believed in him as your Lord and Savior. Here's how John Piper describes it. Christ is our attorney and his portfolio is his propitiation. He stands before his Father in heaven and every time we sin, he doesn't make a new propitiation. He doesn't die again and again. Instead, he opens his portfolio and lays the exhibits of Good Friday on the bench before the judge. Photographs of the crown of thorns, the lashing, the mocking soldiers, the agonies of the cross, and the final cry of victory. It is finished. So what does a resurrection mean for you and for me? Well, the answer to that question depends on what you believe. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if you've done this, then this is the promise born again believers have been given in Romans chapter 8. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies back to life through His Spirit who lives in you. Speaking about believers, J.C. Ryle writes, Let us not fail to see the manner of our Lord's resurrection, a type of pledge of the resurrection of His believing people. The grave could not hold them beyond the appointed time, and they shall not be able to hold them. A glorious angel was a witness of his rising. The glorious angels shall be the messengers who shall gather believers when they rise again. He rose with a renewed body, yet, yet a body real, true, and material, and so shall his people have a glorious body and be like their head. We, when we see him, we shall be like him. However, the word of God is clear, but those who have chosen not to put their faith in Jesus and didn't believe in him. Jesus said this himself in John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. And then in Revelation, chapter 21, verse 8, tells us what that condemnation will be. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The Lord has finished the work of salvation and is now up to each individual whether to decide he will, that he will accept them or reject him. It is a terrible thing to reject such a gift of love. If someone refuses to believe on the Lord Jesus, God can do nothing else but condemn him. Now what about those who say they believe Jesus rose from the dead, but don't live like they actually believe it? Truth is, that kind of faith is a dead faith. Here's a good illustration that explains what dead faith is. It's the kind of faith which will lead a man to take a bottle of medicine from his medicine cabinet. Looking at the instructions on it, he says, I'm sure they're correct. I have all the confidence in the source of the medicine. I know who wrote these directions. I believe everything about it. I know this will relieve my headache if I just take it. But he takes the medicine bottle and puts it back on the shelf. He doesn't lose his headache, it continues on. 
Yet he can say, I believe that medicine, I believe all about the medicine, but still he won't take it. That's dead faith. Again, let me go back to Romans chapter, nine, chapter 10, verse 9, and draw out that second factor that pertains to salvation. There it says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is of immense importance that we understand and realize the fact that all real faith lies in the heart. It does not dwell in understanding. It does not lie in the province of the intellect. It is not the result of reasoning. No education will give it. Faith is in the belief of the heart. But why does God say, believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead? Well, number one, the resurrection is a seal of all. By raising him from the dead, the Father showed that he accepted the ransom Christ paid. Therefore, all rest is contained in this. God raised him from the dead. And secondly, the resurrection of Christ is our resurrection. We rise, we rise in him now with a newness of life, presently to a life in glory. Therefore, know this. Like everything else that is lifeless, dead faith is useless. What God wants from you is a living faith, a faith that is active, that is growing, and that is multiplying. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to Him must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who seek Him. So as I begin to close this Easter service, I hope that some of your questions about the resurrection will have been answered. Now, I do realize that some of you probably have more questions, but the truth is a lot of them will only be answered by God through the Holy Spirit. Yet this can occur until you've been born again by the Spirit. Here's what Isaiah 11, chapter 2 says happens when God's Spirit makes His home in you. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And in Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, God said this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statues and carefully observe my ordinances. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that when I close in prayer. But before I do, I want to share with you one more illustration that beautifully describes what this day means to all believers. As spring arrived this year, I watched as a new growth literally exploded from the ground. I began to think about the trees, which, looked, which had looked so dead, but which were now budding and bringing forth blossoms, leaves, and eventually fruit. I thought about the flowers which would bloom and the grass would grow and grow and grow. The ground had been holding life all winter, just waiting for the promised moment. I began to think about how impossible it would be to hold back the spring. You could chop down trees, but their stumps would sprout. You could dig up flowers, but their seeds would grow. You could plow the ground, but the grass and vegetation would come back. You could even drop a nuclear bomb, but it could not stop the spring. It is impossible. Life would be popping out all over. It was the same with the resurrection of Jesus. Death could not keep its grip on him. He exploded from the grave full of life, and his life was life-giving. The life in Jesus that lifted him from the grave now lives in us who know him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your word. And I thank you again for the resurrection for proving without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is your Son. I pray for those who are hearing and listening to this message at home or in their cars, wherever they may be, that they may be encouraged. Lord, they may be strengthened by the fact that we have a Savior 
who is not dead, but is alive. I pray now for those who have never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray that they will receive your Son now, Lord. And if that's you, and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ in, as Lord and Savior, just close your eyes and bow your head. And with all sincerity, pray this. Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. And now I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is your son and that he died on the cross for my sins. I confess him now as Lord and believe in my heart that he was raised from the dead. So fill me now with your Holy Spirit so that I may walk with you and know you and see the world as you see it, Lord. I freely accept your forgiveness. And I thank you for making me born again. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that, sincerely, you are now a child of God. And want to hear about it, let us know. Call us, write us, text us. Send us a message on one of our social media pages. But let us know. We like to encourage you and maybe help you in your next step of your, of your Christian walk. In spite of the stay-at-home orders and the quarantine that we're currently under, I hope that this message helped you to understand the importance of the resurrection of Christ. And that it will bring you joy and that it will bring you peace, encouragement, comfort, strength. Let us rejoice. And always remember that He is not dead. He is risen. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll see you again next week.